In 2001, The Princess Diaries introduced the world to a young Anne Hathaway in the story about a 15-year-old girl who finds out she's a princess. Along with several other unresolved storylines given to the dozens of featured extras that bloat out this film for some reason. I get that this is like a fairy tale version of San Francisco, but how many heartwarming details can we cram in? I've been to that city, and the only thing I got crammed with were actual heartworms. But that's on me, because I forgot to chew my heart guard before before hitting Folsom Street. Before you burn me at the stake, I actually really like this movie, okay? I think it's rather well adapted from a young adult novel, with witty humor and a timeless style that aged pretty well for something from the Bush era. But that doesn't mean it's free from tasteless jokes, editing oddities, or semi-complete subplots. Also, if you were an actor in the early thousands and couldn't get work, it's because director Gary Marshall gave every small speaking role to one of his grandkids, producers, or longtime friends. So let's get royally flushed by some good old fashioned Hollywood nepotism in a much requested installment of Clip Breakdown. Ugh. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other content here on the web, and we break it up like the British royal family so that we can look at each individual clip and say, that's a royal highness, or that's a royal ho no ho ho. And today we're touching upon The Princess Diaries, and I know for a fact that there's at least one person in my comments who comments on every video asking for this movie. So this is for you, baby. But before we get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more clip breakdowns on your favorite Disney childhood theatrical releases. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. So turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when I'm sliding into your royal family like your long lost princess daughter. A lot of us remember this family film from childhood. So I was excited to watch it for, I think, the first time all the way through. I've really only caught bits and pieces of it when it was playing on cable. And while I don't think that this movie is bad necessarily as a whole, it's entertaining, I found it to be sort of like peak teen romantic movies for the early thousands because it kind of pulls in a ton of elements from movies we've seen in the past, which makes sense since this script was in development for years and the lead role was offered to, it sounds like, dozens of other other actresses who were popular over the years before it finally found a home with Anne Hathaway, who was, I think, 21 when she filmed this, although IMDb says she was 17 when she filmed it. Maybe it's somewhere in between. She was maybe 21 when it came out, but she wouldn't have filmed it four years earlier, so I don't know. Either way, you get a feel for how cool this main character is from her spunky lifestyle home right off the bat. Are you feeling confident? Okay, now just remember, when you make your speech, don't look at the people. Hipster mom thought it would be so cool to live in a renovated firehouse. But unfortunately, two of her other children have already fallen to their deaths from having to swing from these great heights every day just to reach the peanut butter. Mama, how is this house gonna work out for you when you're 60 and you have to jack in the beanstalk your ass up 12 feet in the air just to access the spice rack? It's cute for now, but think practically. Right off the bat, you'll notice that the director gives a good amount of time to people who have nothing to do with this plot, like even just when extras are approaching the scene, you'll hear a lot of detail about what they're doing at school that day. And it's like, okay, realism, come through. You know, as men as the team, I really think you should be the star this year. Oh, oh, oops. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. We know you saw her, Spencer. You've been trying to lay that ass on every student here at School Uniform Academy since eighth grade. We get it, you're a power bottom. Those two are actually a couple and that's their way of proposing that they're looking for a third. Just make some forced butt contact and then play it off like an accident if they don't seem into it. Mandy Moore is in this movie as like the mean girl and I'm just like, yes. I like seeing Mandy Moore as the mean girl more than I like seeing her as that girl who died of cancer. And I'm the only one who's not afraid to say it. Like, my apologies to the main character, but these girls are pure vibes. Mandy Moore is playing a 15 year old who dances like a recent divorcee who got a little drunk on her first night at Cabo. 
right from the beginning of the school day, we get a feel that Mia is a very shy girl. When she's trying to give her opinion on school uniforms at the debate club, she almost pukes. And that's like, everyone's making fun of her for that. We also see that she works at a rock climbing gym and her mom lets her know that her grandmother, who she's never met before, wants to have tea with her. Basically, we get a little bit of backstory on how Mia's mom and dad divorced when she was just a baby and the dad lives overseas in England until he died just a few months ago. So while they weren't really close, she was always like aware of him. I just want to point out that this rock climbing thing never comes up again. And I mean, it really doesn't make or break the movie, but <laughs> once I look back on it, I am like a little bit annoyed by these details. Like rock climbing never once plays into the story ever again. So it's just these details that get added because they were in the book. She mentions rock climbing later on as something that she does, but I think it would have been cool if rock climbing is something she has to like do with her grandmother or use to save the day at some point, like her climbing skills. I don't know. I just noticed there's a lot more loose ends on this movie than maybe people realize, which is not uncommon with young adult novel based movies. Like all of these things that you wouldn't know about unless you read the book that I found out from reading IMDb, but I'm not here to read a book. I'm here to watch stupid movie. Anyway, Mia goes to meet her grandmother who is played by, of course, Julie Andrews. And we get, you know, this fish out of water stuff with Mia. You look so young. Thank you. And y you look so clean. Well, of course she does. She's got a team of chambermaids who scrub her down with hot water and lie every morning because it keeps the complexion royally raw and translucent like a fetal rat. I think that I sound exactly like older Julie Andrews. I want to look raw and pink like mice you would feed to a pet snake. Nope, I lost it. I want to point out here in The Princess Diaries how good the sound design is and how well you can tell the difference between this big budget movie and something like a Disney Channel or original movie. Like in this awkward silence where you're like, oh, is Anne Hathaway gonna call her old? You hear like the clock ticking, you hear the room tone just billing like that deafening silence. These are the kind of things that take, you know, professional sound design and mixing to really get right. And you don't have the budget or the time to do all of that in a TV movie, which is why they would normally sell a joke like this with background music. Like, you know, you'd be like, you look very clean. Like they just do like this music, this like stock music throughout all of it to kind of emphasize the jokes. So I really loved seeing how that's different in this movie. And one of the reasons why I found it so enjoyable, despite whatever I say about it throughout this review. When they're having tea, Clarice, which is the name of Mia's grandmother, drops a bomb. Amelia, have you ever heard of Edouard Christophe Philippe Gerard Rinaldi? No. He's the royal horse doctor we've brought along to euthanize you. Come along, Edouard. They said, we were kind of just waiting to see if your natural hair texture got a little more Anglo-Saxon after puberty, but it's not looking good, so lights out. Here's where we have our inciting incident, and you know what? It's also a moment that was heavily used in the trailer. You are Amelia Mignonette Thermopolis Rinaldi, princess. Of Genovia. Ooh, I'm gonna use that as my new morning affirmation. You are Amelia Minotamanu Limanakani Nanaldi, and you have the meatiest ass at the Genoa Salami Convention. Mm, now I feel just like a princess. Of course, uh, this is a surprise to Mia Monopolis or whatever. Shut up! I beg your pardon? Your Majesty, in America, it doesn't always mean be quiet. Here it could mean, wow, gee whiz, golly wally. Oh, I, I understand. Oh, so golly wally, you understand more than someone saying shut up out of disbelief? Because that is straight up Peter Piper bollywog language and you're acting like it's just normal British talk. Also, this guy explaining slang is what it feels like when Gen Z kids explain why a TikTok is funny to me in the comments. Yes, sweethearts, I understand what sarcasm is. It just didn't make me laugh. That was what I meant. Oh, look, I have a Mianopolis chocolate coffee tis. That's the other thing about Genovia. It's a fictional land that they say is somewhere between France and Spain. My dumb ass is like, I thought there was an ocean between France and Spain. 
<laughs> I'm just kidding, I didn't really, but I just want that to come across, okay? Also, there's like other Genovian traditions, like the Genovian pear, they love their pears there. They're like the world's most peach full neutral goddamn country in the world. It's like, okay, no wonder they had to make a fake country because any other country that you based a movie on would be like a political choice. Mia is understandably upset that nobody's told her she's a princess for her whole 15 years of life or that her dad was a prince until after he died. I would have been like, I could have been having Christmas Eve in a castle. Ah! I would be having the biggest tantrum. I would be pissing in the corner of that loft house. I was a hearty, spirited child. The mom is making all these excuses for her deception. All I'm hearing is parental selfishness. Well, drink your soup. I'm not really hungry. Fine. See, like, why does even the bowl of soup get to be a supporting character in this movie? She just talked about the soup for no reason and we're supposed to ignore it? I was like, what about the soup? I thought she was gonna look down at the soup and there would be like a note from the grandmother under it that's like, you must do it because your father loved ya, or whatever. Like, that's the kind of thing I expect when you set up something like that. You can't just ignore the soup. And that's what inspired me to create a nutritious, delicious new line of products called Papa Chekhov's Ready to Eat Chowder. Because when you put Chekhov's soup on the table, it always comes back up later. Ding. Sometimes these IMDB trivia things that they put on there, you're like, what 12 year old put this in here? Because it was like, that Louis was actually Anne Hathaway's real pet. And he was played by six different cats. I'm like, so which was it? She brought six identical cats on set or like she brought her real cat and then they cast five identical cats that were trained or she adopted the cat after the shoot or is none of that true and someone just misconstrued a fact from the director's commentary on the DVD and typed it into IMDb like an idiot. We don't know but we're here to talk about it. My name is Nick Duramio and I'm talking into a tree. You guys can you see this brand new leaf when the Monstera has a new leaf it's literally so cool because they're Waxy. All right, let's meet some more of the wonderful characters of San Francisco. I've never ridden in a limo. He admitted bitterly to himself as he crossed to the open window. I can't decide why I feel like this is another example of Walt Disney Studios giving us a coded queer character. I guess for whatever reason, it just seems like a very gay job to be a sad writer. But that's queer people for you. Super fun to have at parties with a really tragic backstory. Because of her father's death, they need a blood relative to take the throne or Genovia basically goes over to these barons who are much more far removed from the throne. You can tell from their harsh makeup, you're supposed to know like they're unscrupulous. But Mia doesn't know if she wants to be the princess because she doesn't see herself like that. Obviously she's been an ugly duckling her whole life because of her gorgeous face and beautiful skin and flawless features. But the mother is like, okay, we'll let her take the finishing school stuff that she would need to become a princess to help her decide if she wants to take on this responsibility. Mia promises to attend princess lessons until your ball. You better keep that American accent in check, lady. It's in Julie Andrews' contract that she has to be the most British person on set or else. When she saw the costume assistant's corgi one day, she took it into her dressing room and smothered it. No joke. Clarice has her head of security named Joe be Mia's chauffeur for the time being to kind of protect her and guide her because she's, you know, royalty now. She needs security. Joe is a funny guy. I don't know what else to tell you. I don't want to say anything else about him. He's sucks. I don't like him. I don't know. Meanwhile, Mia is continually the butt of people's derision at school. Tell me, Mia, is it true about your speech? Are you really speaking at the bulimic convention? So you can speak and barf at the same time? Aw, <laughs> how nice that Disney decided to take it upon themselves to introduce eating disorders to every girl in your daughter's fifth grade class. Maybe in each of the DVD cases, they could also include a pixie stick filled with opiates. Throughout the movie, we get this subplot of Mia being really inept at gym class. She's like, I'm a climbing the wall type of girl. It's like, that takes a lot of athleticism. So I don't know what you're talking about. Also, I don't wanna hear in the comments how oily my face looks. If you knew how humid it was up in here, you would literally send me all of the money in your bank account. And that's on period. Okay, outside of the gym class thing that, you know, is super fun. We also have Lily. So there's like, you know, probably five plots going on in this movie, ABC. C, D, E, which is cool. Lily is a lot, the best friend. Well, at least your dad's still alive. Hey, I thought you're getting over that. It's been what, two months? 
No, best friend, I think you're confusing the time my dad died with the time I caught mono. What kind of thing is that to say to somebody? <laughs> Throughout most of this movie, we just have to put up with Lily being more insensitive than my dead left nipple. Fun fact, it was the only part of me that didn't come back to life after they buried me in that haunted cemetery. I guess Lily's thinking here is like, since they were distant, her dad and Mia, but Mia points out like, well, he did pay for my tuition. He sent me these beautiful gifts like my Fabergé egg roller coaster carousel. And I'm just like, why do you even have to explain that? <laughs> like, you knew him, he's wrote you letters. Although to me, it's like, why did he write letters but never spoke to her on the phone? They don't mention ever speaking to each other on the phone. That seems weird, but whatever. Maybe in Genovia, they don't have phones. They only use quills and papers. Let's meet some more of the kids of San Francisco. He fixes cars, he plays guitar, and he can sing. Me at age seven explaining why my sister's Ken doll was the coolest toy in the house. His best friend is Barbie, who drives him everywhere in her pink convertible so he can help her pick out clothes. I love those two girls. He drives a car and he's super sweet. Ugh! All right, Bethany, we don't need you to use your school play voice in the house. Mia is up in this castle acting like she doesn't know what a home goods is. Like she sees every single thing and she touches it. She sees a vase and she's like, oh, let me pick the lid up. She sees a pear and she's like, oh, a pear, let me touch it. She sees this statue and she touches it and breaks the finger off. There are so many times where she does this that I missed, like I lost count of a lot of them. Wouldn't she eventually just learn not to touch stuff? I don't know. Anyway, Mia is getting her princess training from Clarice. Princesses never cross their legs in public. Are you a princess, Madam Stephanie? No one cares what you do with your legs. Chop them off at the knee and toss them into the pigsty for all we care. In the next scene, the mom reveals that she's dating the history teacher who, I mean, to me, this whole plot point is really confusing because I don't recall them ever coming to like a solid conclusion with it. It seems like Mia is like, mom, that's gonna make me even more of an outcast. And the mom is like, I can't do anything right. But like, what happens with that? What happens with that, Gary Marshall. And if there is something in here that I missed, I'm annoyed that it wasn't made a bigger deal. I read on IMDb that this was a much bigger plot point in the book. So there you go. It all comes down to the book making more sense. Well, I'm gonna say it again. I don't wanna read a book. I have a Kindle because I thought it could access the internet. When I found out it couldn't, I just put it under my seat cushion and used it to warm up my ass. Okay, back to me as gym class. Legit, get off the gym class. I don't care about me kicking no ball. Just block one, Mia, just block one. I can't do this, I'm a girl. What am I, a duck? Oh, don't say that. I don't think those diaper shorts you're wearing make you look like a duck. I think they make you look like the little boy from Jurassic Park. Throughout the movie, Mia has a crush on this cool kid whose name I can't remember, but he's played by Eric Von Detten, who we all know, of course, from movies like Brink, shows like So Weird. He was, you know, a very famous Canadian actor at the time. Mia, throughout her adventures, is getting closer and closer with Joe, her guardian. Don't forget the shoes. Strange town, San Francisco. When I purchased the pumps, I asked if I wanted them wrapped or if I wanted to wear them. Um, don't flatter yourself. Nobody who sells shoes for a living thinks you're gonna cram those Italian ham bones into a size eight pump. It's the subtle homophobia for me, Joe. You know what you can do? You can drive this car right into a tunnel being chased by paparazzi for all I care. Is that too much to say? Are British people gonna cancel me? Don't do it. Don't cancel me. <laughs> I'm just a baby. Joe pushed me to it with him talking. I've never put on pantyhose, but it sounds dangerous. We get it, sir, you're straight. When it somehow becomes super important that we locate a human being who has never worn heels or pantyhose before, maybe all of this fragile masculinity will suddenly come in handy. But for now, just keep driving uphill, daddy. We don't need to hear all of the commentary. Another example of movies loving that song that's like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's like seven songs that I only know from Matilda, like these, Matilda taught me how to be a child. Joe is giving Mia ballroom dance lessons. She's comically undignified. And then we get this little bit of detail between Joe and Clarice. You've been wearing black too long. This movie really wants us to believe that two months is a long time to be mourning your dead child. How come Joe is like, it's been 60 days since you bury your son. It's time for letting me in or the let me sweep the dusty floors of your chapel. Oh. Your dusty stained glass windows need some polishing. I don't know what the voice is anymore. Two months is not a long time for your dad to be dead or your child to be dead. It's not. Why didn't they just make that time period longer like it was last year or something? They're treating it like it was a year ago. So Joe and Clarice dance. So I guess that A, they have some sort of romance going on or B, they will in the sequel or C, it just is supposed to show that Clarice is not 
that old lady. She's got a pulse in there. Her ephemeral artery is still on the prowl. There's this guy, Alexander, I think, the guy with red hair, he's in the mix, like all these kids. Shazam. Cute Jeremiah, but a way to a girl's heart is not by treating her like a vending machine. Um, Lily, don't speak for the whole school or for Cardi B. Jeremiah, sweetheart, you're gonna find a girl who will let you swipe your nose like a credit card anytime you need some ice cold milk or some stale Pop Tarts. Mia is late for her makeover. This is the scene that dazzled everyone in the world when we saw this ugly bitch, this piece of sh looking dumb ass dumb this garbage looking woman from hell becoming a presentable semi-human shape I'm exaggerating because she looks beautiful to me before like literally she just has a hair piece in that's curly and glasses and they did put eyebrow extensions on they gave her like false eyebrow hairs to give her fuller looking brows the guy who does the makeover even says these would be the eyebrows if Brooke Shields and Groucho Marx had a baby Brooke Shields has gorgeous eyebrows she's known for having gorgeous eyebrows Frida Kahlo is known for having gorgeous eyebrows, so whatever, Disney. Shut up with your beauty standards. Where is the beautiful girl? And my granddaughter, Amelia. <gasps> she is gorgeous. Literally looking like she is ready to model in a Vogue editorial photo shoot right now. But I get it, we have to broadcast how undesirable, naturally curly hair texture is in order to pay homage to the strong foundation of white colonialism that the entire Magic Kingdom is based on. Bruce the hell Ooh, perfect. We just knocked out all of our brand sponsorships and product placement in one cluttered shot. Is there any more room on that table for the teen spirit scented tampons or the drinkable yogurt contraceptives? It seems like Anne Hathaway, even though this was her first feature film, she was given a lot of input on set by Gary Marshall to make this feel more real. For example, he included the retainer in the other scene that she brought in from her home, like that was her actual retainer. And this part was her idea as well. He's all right. <laughs> As a hairstylist, tell me you have no black clients without telling me you have no black clients. He said, let me just dry brush through this thick wavy hair like I'm Velcroing your head to my shoes. Let me just tear through these strands like it's a fucking plate of hot wings on game day, baby. Let's get the ranch going and get this makeover underway, Sergeant. But of course, after hours and hours of putting on translucent powder, this is the result. A princess. I know there are already a lot of Disney movies that talk about beauty being on the inside or how appearances don't matter. So it's refreshing that this movie honestly and unironically tells us that Mia's biggest obstacle to becoming a royal princess was having not girly enough makeup or straight enough hair. And if Genovia's royal family is anything like the British one, then soon Clarice is gonna be like, also, you're not really friends with that one brown girl at your school, are you? Lily is giving us unsupportive best friend vibes nonstop. Oi, who destroyed you? Oh, um, y y you think it, it looks that bad? You should sue. Because this bitch is you blind? Luli, you don't know anything about fashion or style. My grandmother's from Europe. She cannot shut up about it. I'm like, Lily, you can get out of this limo that I'm giving you a ride to school in. Is that cool? Also, I can't believe I haven't even had a chance to talk about it yet, but Lily's brother is the cool musician guy that those other girls were like, he's totally sweet, who Mia has a crush on. You have one of these bags? You know, we could hawk that and feed a whole third world country. You used to care more about what was inside your head instead of on it. How come Mia is not allowed to wear makeup or straighten her hair, but Lily gets to come to school every day in total big comfy couch drag? No one get a goddamn keratin treatment around Lily here or she'll think you sold your soul to the devil. Come on, it's high school. Joe has some wise words of advice. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Eleanor Roosevelt said that. That's true, she also said, <laughs> It's a lesser known quote from when I pushed her down the stairs for walking too slow. See Mia, you're not the only smart classy one who knows quotes. Lily, it's time for me to snap at you. That's Mia talking. Um, Lily! Stop it, okay? Look, just because your hair sucks, get off mine. Yes, sweetheart, maybe we can unclip half of your barrette collection now since we made it through third grade school picture day. Mia is really embarrassed about her silky smooth hair, even though I would be like, mama, it's human, it's all human. But the rest of the school, like, I hate kids. I hate teenagers. Teenagers, I hate you. What? <sighs> mama Mia! <laughs> 
look who's trying to fit in now. It's a wig, right? I think it looks really sweet, Mia. Thank you to the only other girl who had to perm her hair in order to feel accepted at this godforsaken school of the 1% teenage dirtbags. They didn't like her hair when it was big and curly. They don't like it when it's straightened. What do they want from her? Mia's supposed to be reading books. She's learning how to wave like a lady. Oh, I guess this is done because you get tired from waving for so long. Is that gonna feel better? I'm gonna do this for a few minutes and report back. No, I don't want to. Mia's mom is an artist. Remember this. Some moms help their kids with homework. We do this. That seems like a lot of effort to make the kind of painting that they hang up in a pediatrician's waiting room. What if the mom was like, I must be a really good painter because ever since your dad left us, I've been selling every single one to this anonymous art collector at a landfill in Genovia. Hey, wait a minute. The taxpayers of Genovia have been funding your art career for 15 years and you didn't even know because you're what tacky? Wait up! Wait for me! Not you! I don't even know you! I find Lily to be very relatable because she obviously wants to be the main character but realizes she's in a supporting role and she's just bitter about it. It's like when the hot guy you were too shy to talk to at the bar goes home with someone else. So you have to follow them and then break a window so that they're too scared to have sex. Kids, if you haven't been there yet, you will soon. Am I right, ladies? Ha ha ha! I forgot to mention it because this movie has so much going on, but a few scenes ago, Lily was like being a jerk to Mia and Mia had to confess her secret. But now when they return to school, the cat's out of the bag. It seems like all of the media is there and somebody told. So Clarice has to come to the school to get this all sorted out. Mr. T, your majesty, I'm sorry we don't have finer china. Oh, that's you. perfectly all right. Here. That's the bartenders in LA serving the 21 year old muscle twink before handing me my soda water. How did the gay community even evolve to have a muscle twink? How come you have to be a walking gay paradox just to get a swipe right on Tinder? It's revealed that it was the hairstylist who sold the story to the press and they don't immediately fire him. Like he comes back later to do her hair again. I would be like, you're gonna be executed in front of all of Genovia on our cable access television show. And then we're giving away a free car. Genovia is a ruthless dictatorship. They refuse to join the UN. In the book, it seems like Clarice was a much less warm presence. She was actually kind of like an antagonist, like had a competitive thing with Mia and she's the one who told the press, but I can't imagine that Clarice, like Julie Andrews character plays that role. Book readers, let me know in the comments below. Am I getting this right? For those of you who are just joining us. Mia Thermopolis is the daughter of local eclectic artists. They currently live in a refurbished firehouse south of Market Street. Mia is also the only grand child of Queen Clarice Rinaldi, whose husband, King Rupert, passed away last year. We just thought we would give a quick recap for anybody joining us in between commercial breaks while this plays on a Sunday afternoon. I guess the actor, Hector, who plays Joe, had to like stand out in the rain playing basketball for hours to get that 10 second shot. Sometimes the trivia in IMDb movies is just stupid. <laughs> it's like, who wrote that? The time has finally come for Mia's ball. And the hardest part, I guess, is her just walking down the stairs. So after she did that, it's time to just get into the party of it all, I guess. I don't know. It gets a little confusing here for me in the middle. I'm like, this is a long movie. Lord Fricker, let me take your brandy glass. You won't need it in there. Easy on the schnapps. Remember the winter dinner. See, like the drunken lord that they just introduced never gets paid off. And I'm just like, did they cut out some sort of resolution to that storyline? Was there another joke in there that made it seem worth mentioning? We'll never know. I mean, unless I were to watch the nine deleted scenes that come along with this movie, which just goes to show you like the director maybe didn't have the most restraint <laughs> when shooting. Like how long did you really think this movie was gonna be? What parts are actually vital to telling the story? But to be fair, they had the budget to shoot it and then figure it all out later. But Gary Marshall, you know, like a lot of these actors have been in movies that he's directed from all the way back in the 80s, like Pretty Woman. And then some of them are just friends of his or family members of his. Like this little girl is the granddaughter of Gary Marshall. I'm not allowed to go to the party. That was me smoking outside the club in my 20s when I got kicked out for stealing other people's shots. I'm not allowed to go to the party. I've been saying that a lot <laughs> since I watched this movie. Like I was in the shower just repeating it as like, I want to say it as like sloppy little nasally girl as possible. I'm not allowed to go to the party. Sniveling. I'm not allowed to go to the party. I'm not allowed to go to the party. It's moaning Myrtle. She's moaning Myrtle. Moaning Myrtle. Oh, so the Baron and Baroness Von Truck, they're the ones who are going to take the throne if Mia does not. So they're the ones who were like not supposed to love. I think there are a lot of jokes in this movie that people would not get as children. 
how are the children robbing? Would you like to see them, ma'am? Like, I'm just pointing out that the humor here is that that old man put his testicles near that old lady's face. And I'm the only one on YouTube brave enough to talk about it. Some physical comedy for you, baby. <laughs> Leave it to a wealthy old man to not take responsibility for his own limbs, even when they're on fire. This stunt must have taken all day to film, which is not that impressive considering I've lit an entire person's body on fire and that just took a few seconds. Don't give someone a slicked back wet look before they go to a candlelight vigil, just saying. When Anne put that arm into the ice bucket, the fire was supposed to go out, so she panicked and threw that water glass on. You can kind of see, cause I was like, her fingers get really close to the flames there. I don't understand some of these fans Fancy ass people. Please. She didn't realize it was frozen. We do? Well, we should take that much too. Just do the same thing. <laughs> Here we get a little bit of Easter egginess. <clears throat> It happens all the time. That actor actually had the same kind of waiter role and same line in Pretty Woman. And then he was also brought back for The Princess Diaries 2, all of which were directed by Gary Marshall. This was all pointed out to me in a short made by YouTuber Alan Sai. Slippery little suckers. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. How did the guy get a British accent by the next movie? Oh well. Here's another joke that most people would miss. A toast to the Baroness and Baron Van Token. May you always be Baron. Gather around, children. It's time for some clever wordplay about infertility, since you all loved that eating disorder joke so much. This was actually funny. I laughed at the Baron joke. That seems like British humor to me, doesn't it? Very dry and witty. Did you get enough physical comedy for this scene yet? You didn't, because I'm about to serve it up to you hot on a tray. Oh my God. <laughs> was that my fault? These guys don't get paid enough to lie to make you feel better. They said, yes, girl, and now we have to clean it up so that I can pay my wife's medical bills. After that incident, Anne Hathaway's character feels bad. She feels like she let down her dead dad, which I'm just like, don't worry about disappointing your dead dad. Worry about disappointing your live people. What does your dad care? But Clarice is very forgiving. So it's like, okay, none of this mattered. It reminds me of my first royal dinner party. I accidentally knocked over a suit of armor and the spear went right through the suckling pig. It actually pierced the heart of one of your royal servants. It's weird that she always describes the incident that way. Also, there's not a single f***ing flower that goes unsprayed by Clarice in this scene. It's a greenhouse. It's probably humid enough in there. I mean, haven't you noticed the inside of your clothes have become slimy with La Mer body lotion? What happens next? Mia has a car that she's able to drive because Clarice paid to fix it. They go to the arcade. They're bonding. They're bonding. Oof. This movie, we're halfway through right now. Mama. Your father realized that the love he could have for one person, or even two, could not make him forget the love he felt for his country and its people. Boo! That's such a biological father thing to do. If Mia's mother had chosen patriotism over raising the child, this would be called the Witch Hunt Diaries. And Mary Poppins over here would be wearing the executioner's hood. But whatever, I guess men are just allowed to abandon their children and it's heroic. Why? It's delicious. Yeah, just wait till you try it with two of them at once. Then you're really getting treated like a princess, your highness. Also, that's me putting on an old lady wig to get a second free sample at Costco. Oh, here's a good corn dog. Oh, I think I will. When Mia and her grandma are driving back, they get into an accident. Down here! Oh. Death, destruction, chaos. I'm gonna tell my kids this is the Avengers. Also, I'm probably never gonna have kids. Okay, fine, I'll have them, but I'm probably never gonna talk to them. But they can watch these videos. Kids, if you're watching this, go to bed. Also, I don't love you. What, they don't exist. Calm down, family. 911, I need to report an accident. They put me on hold. Oh, for the love of God. No need to take the Lord's name in vain, sister solve a problem like Maria. That's against one of the 10 commandments, right after thou shalt shake your ass on Sunday. This 
is where I noticed like, oh, this movie feels pretty modern, even though it was made over like 20 years ago. Like she has her cell phone, but you can't really see it. The cell phones aren't brought into the plot too much. And like the style, it all feels not too dated. It's pretty timeless and contemporary, which I like. So basically Mia is not even supposed to be driving without a licensed driver because Clarice doesn't have one, but she gets out of trouble because Clarice like knights the cop and the bus driver on the street there. So like being a princess gets her out of a jam. And I think Mia starts to see, oh wow, you really have some influence to make people feel good about themselves, which I guess is what a queen is for. So next is this plot where the cool kid that Mia kind of likes asks her on a date. Mia, step into my office. Why does he have an accent all of a sudden? Is he trying to talk like he's from New Jersey since he's experimenting with bronzer? I would say try and blend it out with something other than a crumpled up ball of aluminum foil, but I don't know. When Mia tells the boy that is Lily's friend about her date, he's like understandably upset because she has to cancel their plans. She was gonna watch him practice. But Mia's all swept up in the excitement of this boy she thinks is cute asking her out. You know, in old films, whenever a girl gets seriously kissed, her foot would just kind of Pop. You mean pops right inside the guy's ass? Because then not only have I seen that film, I was the leading lady. Also, tell me what this is. Pop. I'm sorry, but since when do we cut to random Parisian vignettes? Is this Amelie? It's very distracting that this is the only time that we cut to some random cutaway like that. It's not an episode of Family Guy. And it made my brain go back and be like, how many other times have they done this in the movie? Zero. Okay. That doesn't necessarily show a lot of editing restraint to me, nor does the fact that that drunk Baron or Lord at the party like never paid off either. Anyway, Mia doesn't see that this guy who was never really nice to her before it might be using her, but she goes to the beach party anyway. Hey, hey, set me free. Stupid Cupid, stop picking on me. Yes, sweetie, you better miss Piggy those high notes. Stupid Cupid, stop picking on me. <laughs> Try and do that at home, I dare you. How does she do it? Stupid Cupid, stop it. Stupid Cupid. Oh, I have to give up and move on because that's so bad. Stupid Cupid, stop picking on me. <laughs> I have to vocally train for that. Stupid cute bitch, stop hitting no, no. Also, as Mia's at this party, she forgot to tell Lily that she's unable to appear on her cable access show, Shut Up and Listen. So Lily's at the show being like, um, we're just waiting for my best friend Mia to show up. So that's a big issue. And then her date is ruined anyway. Wait, everybody, you're on TV. Wait, princess, don't be shy, come back. What if he just fell out of that helicopter to his death and like ruined prom for everyone? Don't be shy, come back! Why does this unseen man who is somehow screaming louder than a helicopter engine, why is he like a Simpsons character? They come out of hiding, the boy and Mia, and the news vultures are all over the place. And clearly this guy wants the press. Give her a smooch. Oh, give her a big slap you all want. I knew she was wearing those chunky flip flops for a utilitarian reason. I just thought she was planning to go boogie boarding with them later. Also, I canceled the media outlets that coerced this non-consensual kiss just as much as Andy Brink who actually did it. One of them said, give her a big sloppy wet one. Give her a big sloppy wet one. Sir, these are children, so we do our best to keep them small, clean, and dry. <clears throat> I don't know what the f kind of new show you work for. Then the mean girls, including Mandy Moore, embarrass her by being like, you can change in this tent. I don't know why she has to change necessarily. But then they push it down and she's exposed in a towel, which is like, I guess that's embarrassing, I guess. And the next day, Mia feels disgraced. San Francisco's own little princess partied at the beach. But what started out as innocent fun soon turned into allegedly too much fun. My new favorite character is this newscaster who spent hours getting her hair done just so she could sit on TV and be like, but where there is smoke, there is the smell of smoke and sometimes Smokey the Bear, however. And also now back to you in the studio. Despite this, it seems like Clarice still feels confident in Mia that she'll be able to overcome this and rule with grace. But the rest of the school, they make fun of her. Hey, it's Mia Thermopolis. That's what they call me when I hit the street with an ice pack in my panties. 
Hey, there's Princess Puckera. You totally got her ass, Bendy Jessica. I love how mean you've become since your spinal injury. How many featured extras with special skills did they need to hire for this movie just to be like, can you say something now? No, but you can re-record my line later. Perfect. Later on, when she's apologizing for missing the cable show, Mia and Lily have a heart to heart about Lily's kind of jealousy that she's been suppressing. Having the power to affect change, make people listen. How many teenagers have that power? It's just Billie Eilish, Greta Thunberg, and you. Wait, is Kim Possible still a teenager? Hey Siri, is Kim Possible sexually mature yet? Actually, don't answer that. I wasn't asking for me. Ugh. Ah! Are you still on the edge of your goddamn seat about the gym class thing? Ugh. She's a princess now. Like, we know it doesn't matter if she passes school or not. She's gonna be a princess in like a minute. Mia, it's not a championship game. It's not even a big game. It's just gym class. Just hit the ball. I don't want to flunk you in gym class. I don't care how much tuition costs at this school. If the gym teacher is really failing students for not being good at the sports, she's way overthinking her job. Did the student show up today? That's a check. Did they try to swing the bat? That's a check plus. Then it's see you at graduation, chicken arms. Try not to break any of those pretty teeth. <sighs> Mia uses her anger at the boy who slighted her to get a home run. So now we can put that dumbass plot point to rest. Now that we're all loving it. Uh, and now that I'm talking about it and I'm at hour goddamn 17 of shooting this video. I think that this movie is clearly based off of a young adult novel. I take it back because it's long. There's so many events. I don't care about any of it. Mia talks to the boy that like she kind of broke his heart a little bit. You don't, don't worry about me. I just consider myself royally flushed. This is the point where other movies are usually ending. I just wanted to point that out to make sure you really savor the three different day players who get a line in every scene of this movie. I don't know if you noticed, but Mia can't glance outside without a pair of window washers doing a mini Abbott and Costello routine. We get it, Gary Marshall. Daily life is beautiful, but not to me, so fuck off. Mia invites that boy to the ball along with Lily just to try to make it nice with him. Meanwhile, the mean girl is still trying it. Listen. Jim, my friends and I were wondering, the sweater you're wearing, was it designed for you or did the knitting machine just blow up? <laughs> Sweetie, that doesn't even really make sense what you just said. And also the garment you're wearing doesn't even protect your bare ass from those chicken wire cafeteria seats. Also, I can't help but notice all of these girls' insults seem oddly rehearsed. Like how do you organize it amongst your friend group so that each one of you get a line? <laughs> Sell glasses, girls. Oh, it's Jeremiah hair glare. Is one of your magic tricks your hair? <laughs> Is one of your magic tricks your hair? Good one, whoever, Ica. That'll really make your parents stop fighting every night. But this is where Mia gets her sweet, creamy revenge. <laughs> She said, let me just cup that frozen custard right in between your boobs. Mia, stop, she has a heart condition, you're killing her. This is just like that Lifetime movie where Tori Spelling gets stabbed that I watch when I can't sleep. Ooh, Mia still has serious doubts about her ability to rule Genovia. People think princesses are supposed to wear tiaras, marry the prince, always look pretty and live happily ever after. But it's so much more than that. It's a real job. It's a full-time job and it's extremely time consuming and it's not as easy as it may appear to some people. Clarice is me trying to validate my profession to people who don't know what YouTube is. It's not all bonbons and rom-coms. I also sing show tunes sometimes. Out of nowhere, Mia gets this idea to like run away in before going to this ball. She's like packing up her things. She's getting ready to go somewhere. I'm like, where are you gonna go? Doesn't seem like the kind of person who could ever run away from home. Like, where are you gonna go? You don't even know how to do your own laundry. Me unlocking my chastity belt after getting a negative STD test. I love this prop, the locket and the lock on the binder. Give it me, give it me. Mia notices this little envelope that falls out of the binder and it's a note from her dad that he always intended for her to read on her 16th birthday. I present you with this diary to fill the pages with your special thoughts special thoughts of your wonderful life. Ew, stop talking so soft and tender like you're your own dad. She said special thoughts from my special girl's special little head. Let's not overhype the princess. Like she's nice and she knows how to rock climb, but what else can she do? Apparently this dad is played by Anne Hathaway's real dad. The brave may not live forever, but the cautious do not live at all. From now on, you'll be traveling the road between who you think you are and who you can be. 
Unfortunately, it's the same road that I had my fatal accident on, so you'll have to drive past my memorial every day on the way to work. Anyway, there are some cute ducks at this pond. Have a good life, I guess. I just thought I would write you this letter, even though I still expect to be alive when I'm gonna give it to you in several years. And if any of that doesn't make sense, it's just Genovian tradition, I guess. Reading this letter inspires Mia to not run away to wherever she was running away to. It inspires her to run away to the ball that she was skipping. Oh, I hate it. She decides to ride in a convertible in the pouring rain, and I'm like, I guess you're 15, so you would do something stupid like this. But even as a 15 year old, I know you couldn't just ride a convertible in the rain. She pulls the tarp off of it, and it's like, you just got this car fixed. You're gonna ruin it. Also, she's not a licensed driver, so it's like, why is she, this is so illegal. Where is she? She went somewhere, I know nothing. Is there a deleted scene that explains why the neighbor's pants are down right now? I'm not trying to blame anyone in particular, but you all let this movie get away with some weird ass stuff. Oy. By the way, Mia apologized to the guy she hurt by sending him a pizza with the sorry spelled out on M&Ms. He loved M&Ms, it was never explicitly mentioned, but he ate them in a couple scenes. And obviously that's a book detail. A lot of book details are coming to light now. I liked this movie before I started making this video. Let's just say that. Before I sat down to record this today, I was all for it, but now I'm like, Pfft. Mia gets stuck in the rain because the car can't drive in the rain. I don't know anymore. But she like gives up and I'm just like, this is the wettest, wettest scene. She looks so wet. Until Joe shows up and gives her the royal ride she needs. And then somehow she's getting there at the same time as her love interest. It's all a lot. She's styling a wet sort of grunge look hairdo and is wearing a sweatshirt, jeans, and docks. Oh, it's cool to see that Rice from Beethoven grew up to be a fashion journalist for Teen Vogue. Again, so glad that we had time to check in here on the sidelines at the one hour and 42 minute mark for this movie. Mia gets on stage and although she has wet hair, it's clear she's the princess of the princesses. I choose to be forevermore princess. Me, the first time I tried on silk underwear. So this means that the other two baronesses don't get to be the king and queen. I hope you didn't order your stationery yet. That lady took three weeks of English lessons for this role. And she did a great job. Most memorable part of the whole movie. So dun da da dun Mia is dancing. She's wearing a custom tiara made from Cubic Zirconia, but I read that Julie Andrews is wearing like, how much was it? It was crazy. It was a $500,000 tiara on loan from Harry Winston made from real diamonds. Not that expensive. I thought it would be over a million, but whatever. That's still a lot of money. For a thing, now that we've finally made it through the dance, Mia is like on a plane, she's super royal. We get some wrap up voiceover, even though never once was there voiceover at the beginning of this. Why? Why do you just add voiceover at the end? It's just such a weird way to wrap things up when it never came in before. Grandma's so glad to be going home. And Joseph, well, he's watching nearby as usual. Everybody's got pre-coronation jitters, including me. Ooh, I'm sure it's gonna be such a wonderful event. If only we could somehow see a continuation of this story, but centered around that royal engagement. Ah, <sighs> maybe one day, if we're ever able to find that missing plane that went down. Anyway, that's all they wrote for The Princess Diaries. What did you guys think of this one? Let me know in the comments below. Also, should I cover The Princess Diaries 2, The Royal Engagement? I think I have a feeling you're gonna say yes. Let me know what else I should cover. Also, give this video Video, a big thumbs up if you want to see even more clip breakdowns like this but most importantly if you're new to my channel I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here that way you never miss new videos from me I upload two new ones every week so turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when we're coronating the royals also I've got merch available and a patreon where you can access bonus episodes and exclusive watch parties and other great benefits you guys are all the greatest thank you so much for putting on a Harry Winston tiara with me today I will see you next time